Okay, thank you for uh, coming for the second talk. I'm going to follow on with the talk we gave yesterday. If you'll recall, yesterday's talk was focused on the basics of what cauda equina syndrome is. While today I will be a re reviewing a little bit of those basics, but I want to talk a little bit more of chronic cauda equina syndrome. So we'll show some data that's available on that, trying to define what it is, get an understanding. But one thing I want you to understand throughout this is one of the things we're trying to do with this project is to learn more about the spectrum of chronic cauda equina syndrome. So I can tell you this is not a well understood condition. There can be a lot of different ways that it can present, and we haven't really characterized that. So I will go through, as we, as I understand it to be, um, explaining the symptoms and trying to go through uh, what the best treatment options will be. You will hear my unique perspective or my perspective about the importance of really multidisciplinary and actually more of an interdisciplinary personalized care program as a way to address chronic cauda equina syndrome. So starting on the slide, again, as with yesterday, I have no conflicts as pertains to this talk, uh, um, not being re reimbursed doing this for you. Uh, the patients. And the goals of this uh, talk on the chronic uh, condition is to extend what we talked about yesterday. I'm going to start with a little bit of the background, reviewing the anatomy. If people missed yesterday's talk, this will get you up to speed. I want to review the location of the cauda equina so you can understand how the disease is. And then I'm going to get to the meat of the talk, which is what is chronic uh, uh, cauda equina syndrome? And lastly, how do we treat chronic cauda equina syndrome? And that's going to be the key part is that last one. Very personalized care, I think, is critical for this. So you'll remember this slide from yesterday. This is just showing you can see the brain, the spinal cord, and then the hand that's under the faucet. And I'm, what I'm trying to do with this is a couple of things. We are looking at both motor pathways that we can see in that red line that's going through that goes all the way to the hand. So there are motor and there are sensory with that sort of blue teal type pattern. That's the sensory pathway. And when you hit the hot water, your finger touches it on the blue. It sends a signal up to the brain, which then comes down through the hand and tells the muscle to contract. So you can see you have this motor sensory. There's also an autonomic system that comes through so three different nervous systems that can be involved in, in nervous system disease, such as cauda equina. And there are different segments that they can be involved in the brain, the spinal cord, and of course, down the arm. And this slide is particularly trying to address that and refresh your memory from yesterday. You have the brain segments, but they then go down the spinal cord and then they go into this section, this lower section in the blue. You can see after you get to the orange and the green and then that sort of darker blue, you've got that lower section where it is just all the wires that go down and extend out. So I will tell you each one of those lines coming out is a different nerve, but down below is that cauda equina or horse's tail. This is all of the nerves that are extending off the spinal cord. So these have come out. These are not upper. These are lower motor nerves extending out of the spinal cord, going down the spinal column to where they exit the spinal cord and head into the body. And this is another depiction of that cauda equina. You can see what it's going to look like with the horse's tail, where you have these nerves that have come off the spinal cord. They go down the spinal column and then come out at different sections, all the way through the lower lumbar, down through the, the sacral area, that's the S region, and even the coccygeal at the tailbone region. So that's a little bit of the anatomy back, uh, background. And then repeating what we had said towards the last half of the talk was what is cauda equina syndrome. And because you've got all of these lower motor nerves, it is loss of function of those lower motor nerves in the cauda equina where they're all caught together. Okay, we've reviewed the definition. and This is important for some of the studies and how they defined it. We went through this. This is a little bit more of a strict research type definition for cauda equina syndrome, the dysfunction of mctrician, defecation, and or sexual uh, function with no explanation and altered sensation in the saddle area with possible neurologic deficit in the lower limbs, that's motor or sensory or reflex changes. 
Again, expanding on that a little bit more, that's matrician defecation, that's bowel and bladder, sexual function. And then we talked about the sen the altered sens sensory in this saddle area. Okay, how will this present? This will present with back pain, bowel and bladder dysfunction, numbness, weakness, and sexual dysfunction. Remember when we showed you that the, the anatomy yesterday, we showed that this was the lower areas. So if you get symptoms in the arms, that's not the cauda equina. Even in the hips, that's not the cauda equina. Cauda equina is this L4, L5, S1, and all the way down to the tailbone. And that is the area that covers the back of the legs, the bowel and the bladder areas. So that's why we refer to saddle anesthesia as part of it. So back pain, bowel and bladder, saddle anesthesia, numbness. You can get weakness in the legs with this and the sexual dysfunction. Those symptoms can be present to varied degrees. Not everybody's going to have all of that. Okay. And this was a slide we showed yesterday about a cauda equina event. You can see on, in section A, you've got the spinal cord coming down at the very top that ends. And then just like in that drawing that we had, there's the cauda equina coming through the tiny, tiny little uh, nerves that are going through. And then where that arrow is, there was a giant disc that came out and crushed all the nerves at that level, causing the cauda equina. And in section in slide B portion of it, you can see where that disc had poked itself out. And this is, again, emphasizing that saddle anesthesia that we talked about yesterday that you can see in this diagram when it's down lower. So we talked about that L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, all the way down to S5 and even the coccygeal area. You can see how that has a saddle pattern in terms of those are marked with the S's on the person that's turned away from you. You can see all of that. And so it's not going to have so much numbness in the front of the leg, but you'll get it in the back of the leg. Again, the saddle pattern. All right. So that's reviewing what we talked about yesterday in terms of what is cauda equina. We also talked about the potential causes of it, and I'm not going to review that again, but we talked about trauma, infectious, cancers, a lot of different things that can cause it. And a percentage of people it will be idiopathic. That is, we never find the cause with it. They may have normal imaging. But the next question is, what's acute versus chronic? You know, a lot of these studies are going to be looking at acute because there it's easy. These are the somebody who shows up in the emergency room after a car accident or somebody with a sudden disc that has come out. Um, these are going to be the acute cases. The chronic, it's a different question. How do you define those? Well, we've never truly defined a line for cauda equina, but in general, what we refer to as acute is the first few days or weeks is generally acute. Chronic usually requires six months worth of symptoms. And this is for a research understanding. I mean, obviously, when somebody develops an acute problem within weeks, if it's not getting better, it's going to become chronic. But from a real technical point in terms of trying to analyze what are the symptoms and what is the disease? We uh, neurologists or just researchers, clinical researchers in general, will require six months of symptoms before we can say all of these people are acute, are chronic rather than acute. This slide we showed yesterday, and this was looking at the acute presentation. Okay, this is different from where we're going to go in just a second. But this is, remember, I showed you the different symptoms that cauda equina can have. Well, this is what were people complaining of, the proportion of people that were complaining of symptoms when they presented to the emergency room. Now, these were people who were diagnosed with cauda equina. It's, there's a lot of selection bias, as I think nearly all of them were trauma or herniated disc related, as opposed to some of the other causes I mentioned yesterday, including infection and um, other lesions that are inflammatory, lesions that aren't going to be, that may not be seen on an initial MRI. Anyway, you can see those symptoms that they can present with, which again, the sciatica, back pain, radiating down the legs, the saddle anesthesia, the bowel, the bladder problems, sphincter tension, anal tension, and sexual dysfunction. There isn't that much of a mention of strength because strength can sometimes be normal initially. It may be difficult to sort out. It may be there if there's a huge uh, lesion, but if not, it may not be. So that's, that's sort of where they present acutely. And that's in that first few days or a week when they present 
what the literature has, that was a retrospective study of about 75 patients that had shown up with cauda equina. There hasn't been any other study larger than I think that one looking at 75. So it's still limited by the small number. But now do we have any evidence of what happens, what chronic is going to look like? Okay, this is from that same paper that was looking at the acute. And you can see I've got the reference down below, the people presenting with some of these different problems. And this is mctrician dis dysfunction. And what we've got here is you've got your X and your Y axis and the prevalence you can see listed there. And then you can see on the bottom, you've got the presentation, the follow-up one and follow-up two. I will tell you follow-up one is relatively close to when the event occurred. So that's within a couple of weeks to a month. So this is the first follow-up. The second follow-up visit is really varied. It's months, but some of these people at, that were included at follow-up visit two were almost pretty close to a year out before the surgeons had seen them again. Again, this is a retrospective. So they, they didn't, there's not any control to this. This is just looking through charts in the hospital of when people presented with this. And the take home from this that you can see is when we look at mctrician, this is urinary changes, okay? Somebody presenting with cauda equina that we talked in that first group that had urinary problems, they got better, but they didn't get 100% better. So again, can chronic cauda equina, this is a glimpse, especially in that follow-up too, that cauda, chronic cauda equina syndrome can have chronic uh, bladder problems with the mctrician difficulties. This is defecation, stool problems. Again, you can see depending on how they spin the data, looking at this raw data, which is the one you want to look at the most, as much as 20% of them had it. Uh, in the other data where they got up to 40%, they had adjusted the data to account for some missing points and it, it ri rose to about 40%. So somewhere between that number can have chronic uh bowel problems. So we know bowel and bladder problems can be present with chronic cauda equina. And this is that numbness in the saddle area. And the same thing can be present with there. In other words, we're seeing a lot of the things that we defined for acute cauda equina as we get into the chronic state in people who had surgery, was identified early, may persist, which leads us to think of do we really know how many people have cauda equina? Because there's a lot of people that have the acute that aren't being monitored for the chronic cauda equina. And this is sciatica, the back pain. This actually surprised me a little bit because it wasn't one of the major criteria that was there. But look at this. They, if they presented with it and you looked at them as much as a year later, so a lot of them still had sciatica and back pain. So again, back pain is a major a problem that can continue with this. So again, this is that slide we showed before of all of the symptoms, back pain, bowel and bladder dysfunction, numbness, weakness, sexual dysfunction. These are all things that can be pre that are present with acute cauda equina and just as much can be present with chronic cauda equina. That these are symptoms that we need to characterize more and the reason for uh, getting this set up and, and doing the registry that is being done is to, is to really try to get a good understanding of the spectrum of how severe these symptoms are and how disabling each one of these are rather than relying on some of this acute retrospective talking with people directly about it. All right, so now we've talked about what we think it is chronic cauda equina, what are the components of it? It's very similar to acute, but it's longer lasting. The next question is, how do you manage it? All right, well, the first thing we can say, you can see it right here, there's no specific cures. If you have a herniated disc, obviously surgery is going to be critical. If you've got trauma, surgery is going to be critical. If you've got some inflammatory or infectious cause or cancer cause, addressing those causes are going to be critical. And that's going to, if you get to those quickly enough, that's going to be closest to getting a treatment that's going to be a cure. But as you go into that six months of chronic symptoms, right now we have no specific cures. In the future, there are some studies of medications that could potentially cross over and help. Nobody's looking at cauda equina syndrome, but there are people looking at neuropathy and neuropathy medications that could potentially help somebody with cauda equina, but nobody has really done the studies to see if that's actually the case. So no specific cures are in place. That being said, 
there are a lot of treatments. And I want to be very clear that just because there isn't a cure doesn't mean you can't treat the disease. We have a lot of ways that we can begin treatments that can try to improve function. As I always tell patients when I see them, don't let your disease define you. You define your disease. So if you have chronic cauda equina, what we need to do is we need to find a treatment program that will, number one, address your symptoms, try to control your symptoms, and number two, improve your functional status to allow you to improve your mobility, to get as close back to the activities that you were doing before if you that you were. Maybe there will be some modifications in what you can do. You'll never run a marathon. I'll never run a marathon again, okay? But, you know, we can still keep a lot of things, uh, keep a lot of the activities going and trying to get that normal, uh, bringing back some of the, the, the things that you had done, re re resulting in some functional recovery so you can do activities. How do we do this? Well, it's personalized care. Okay? And this, I like this diagram. I've used it across different diseases. When you look at any of these, this is the core. We talk about this spoke with a lot of hubs. Nobody's at the top. Nobody's at the bottom. Okay. The only thing that's important is in the middle is you as the person with the disease. The next most important is the care partner. This could be a family member. This could be a friend, but somebody that knows a lot about the difficulties that you're having and is guiding you through this course as you're going through all your life course as you're going through this disease. So you're in the center. The care prob, uh, partner is right next to you negotiating this. And on, on the outside is all of the different specialists that include urologists if there's bowel dysfunction. I didn't include gastroenterologists, but they would help with the stool dysfunction, occupational therapists to improve your functional status at home, physical therapist for walking, primary care, neurology, and I even include clinical scientists because if people are conducting research and there's no specific cures for this, get involved in research. Let's find treatments. Let's do more to help out. Get proactive. Attack this. Community support, social workers. These are all, and again, nobody is at the top. In other words, you get a particular problem you need you'd call that person. It's not like everything goes through your primary care provider and then you go out to what you need. If it's something that needs your psychologist help, you're going to call them. Your urologist, you're going to call them. Your neurologist, them. So that person. So you're going to, each person <coughs> is a specialist in their own particular areas. These are their doctors, your doctor of occupational therapy, your doctor of physical therapy. They will help you develop the exercise program. And with chronic cauda equina, you need what's called maintenance therapy. You don't need to see somebody three times a week for a month and say, and say, thank you, we're done. You need to set up a program where you continue to see each of these specialists. It may not be once a month or maybe it's once every three months or depending on how urgently it may be four months. Again, if you've developed, like in the case of a physical therapist, a very good exercise program, you only need to see them intermittently to assess, hey, how am I doing? Do we need to tweak the exercise program? And then you go back to the standard care. So this is the model that I feel is very critical to addressing any of these chronic conditions. And I want to stress, people will talk about a multidisciplinary. This is really interdisciplinary because we're talking about different specialists that are all talking with each other and you're only seeing the specialists that you need for that, okay? If you don't need that specialist, you're spending your time with other specialists. So it is much more of a personalized medicine sort of model. All right. How do we manage it? Now, talking specifically what, from my end, as a neurologist, and you've got other people that are going to talk more about the medications that are particularly involved and which one's best, and do you go with this one and go with that one? And what I want to, I want to stay at that higher level in terms of this without going into specific medications. Just like I stress the importance of seeing all of those specialists within each one of those specialists. And we have talks about people talking about what they're going to recommend because they're going to recommend within their own special specialty, the particular program you're going to want. So as a neurologist within medications, 
we're going to look at things for pain, for bowel, and for bladder type of function. Others will talk about the specific ones, but I wanted to show you a couple of ones just to give you a glimpse of something that's very important when you talk about medications. Okay, this is a, this, and the next slide is graphs of something called number needed to treat analysis. Okay, so in number needed to treat analysis, you say, okay, how many people do I have to treat in order to get one patient that has benefit? Okay, because not every medication works for everybody. So we came up with this way of calculating this number needed to treat. And so the smaller, if the number needed to treat is one, then that means every patient I treat is going to get better. If the number needed to treat is two, then 50% of the people are going to get better. But what I want you to see from this slide is in this number needed to treat analysis, this is for tricyclics, amitriptyline, desipramine, nortriptyline, but these are all these tricyclics. You can, what you can see is that number needed to treat is all over the place. Okay, And if we go back to this one, this is Lyrica, pregabalin. And the same thing, the number needed to treat is all over the place. And the take home from these two slides is that everybody is an individual. Okay, so we go back to our model and we're looking at that personalized health care that we're talking about. And even within the neurology specialty that I'd be working with, I've got to figure out which medications are going to work for you. I remember the analogy of the old analog radios where you had to twist the dials just right to get the perfect reception. Now we got digital stuff and internet, so uh, kids don't know about that. But you remember when we had to just dial it just right. So you have to look at those medications and you can try medication A, medication B, they may not work, but medication C may work perfectly. And that's, you know, when you look at that number needed to treat analysis, what it shows me is the individual variability that gets me back to this program that I'm talking about. When you talk about therapy, it's working with all of your care partners to figure a plan that's going to work best for you. And that's going to be fundamental for how you treat cauda, chronic cauda equina and going after it. So I'll let other people talk more about the specifics, but that's sort of the higher view of what we're looking at. And then hopefully with your help, we'll be able to get a better understanding of what exactly is chronic cauda, what is the spectrum of it, and we can and then develop pathways for better treatment options. So at this point, I want to give my cup of coffee and say thank you uh, for participating in this conference and the uh, listening to me for my talk yesterday as well as today.